Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you tonight uh, on behalf of the admissions office and all of the community here at Harvard Divinity School welcoming the 2015 Diversity and Exploration participants, and especially applauding that you've gotten through your first 48 hours. Uh, you didn't, we didn't tell you it was gonna be a marathon, so we, we, didn't, we didn't want you to know that ahead of time. But I uh, want to welcome the guests that are here tonight. Uh, the community at Harvard Divinity School is made up of a number of people, including people who are outside of the uh, confines, if that was the way to put it, of Harvard Divinity School. So we have faculty here tonight who uh, teach from arts and science. Uh, we're, we're so fortunate to have Dean Hempton join us tonight as well. Uh, we have administrators from Harvard Divinity School. We have alumni. Uh, we have current students, and we even have, I believe, some DivX alumni from previous years. So this is a really wonderful turnout. Um, I think we want to applaud you all, though, the DivXers that are here tonight. If we could give you a hand. And I must confess that behind the scenes, we've been gossiping about you, uh, and it's all good. And so I was asked by the staff if I would share some of the gossip. The gossip, the word on the street is that you all are actually quite impressive. Um, we know that Mama Irene laid down the law. <laughs> And, uh, but even if she didn't, we can tell that you're really an exceptional group, um, and you really have gelled as a cohort, and we would encourage you to continue that in the next uh, 24 hours or so less than you have here. Uh, so uh, again, welcome. Uh, we're also really grateful to have our featured faculty speaker tonight, uh, Professor Matthew Potts, who is the Assistant Professor of Ministry Studies here at Harvard Divinity School. And I want to tell you just a little bit about him, and then we'll have him come up and uh, give his talk. Uh, Matthew Potts joined the faculty of HDS in 2013. He studies the theology and practices of Christian communities with a focus on the relationship amongst narrative, liturgy, and ethics. His book, Cormac McCarthy and the Signs of Sacrament, Literature, Theology, Theology and the Moral of Stories, uncovers a moral framework in contemporary fiction that is deeply indebted to traditions of Christian sacramental theology. His next book project will examine the moral complexities of forgiveness as a religious practice alongside literary fiction and Christian theologies of atonement. He has been published in the journals Religion and Literature and Christianity and Literature, among others, and teaches broadly in the areas of Christian liturgy, theology, and literary studies at HDS. Matt is ordained as a presbyter in the Episcopal Church USA and presently serves St. Barnabas Church in Falmouth as priest and theologian in residence. Let's give a warm welcome to Professor Potts. I think you, did you take my notes, Angela? I, I think you took my notes. <laughs> that's right, that's right. That makes it. That makes it harder. Um, thanks for giving them back. Uh, so th there's, there's, I'm very grateful to be here uh, tonight and for you, to have, for you to welcome me here tonight as, as your featured speaker. I, I'm not grateful that I'm standing between you and the food. Uh, so uh, I'm going to try to keep this. Uh, I, I won't drag on too long. But you've been sitting in lectures the last couple of days, right? So you know how that can go. But uh, I will try to um, be expeditious. Um, as well as insightful before we, before we move to the food. Um, so I'm pleased that you have welcomed me here tonight, but I also wanted to extend a welcome to all of you. It really is a pleasure to have you here on our campus. As you know, coming from your own home institutions, this is a time of the semester where things can start to drag. Uh, people get busy, papers, grading, and so forth. And to have all of you arrive on our campus in the middle of this week, especially when the weather is as it always is in November in, in Massachusetts, <laughs> And the trees are on fire, and it's a, beautiful, it's a beautiful time. And then to have all of you arrive in this building, right when everyone's getting tired, just brings so much spirit and life to our campus. And I really do thank you for it and, and welcome you here uh, among us. And I've been uh, 
just thinking about DevEx and looking through like some of the past year's materials and realizing that I've only been teaching here for a couple of years, but I also TF'd here when I was doing my PhD. Um, and I noticed how many students, of, how many of my most profound and interesting and, and wonderful students were alums of this program, and I didn't even realize it. So um, I know, I hope I will see more of you in, in years to come. I can't help seeing you all as prospective students. I can't help but think of my own story coming here to, to HDS. There wasn't, I don't think there was a DivX when I, when I no, there wasn't a DivX when I was um, thinking about coming here. And that was, that was 11 years ago in 2004 when I first started thinking about coming here to Harvard. And I was, I was knee deep in another life and it was a good life. Um, it wasn't one I was trying desperately to get out of. Um, and I didn't really have much reason to, to embark upon a new life, but I just had this kind of urge, right? And I thought to myself, well, I'll apply to Harvard. And if Harvard accepts me, then I'll take that as a sign that I should maybe do something else. And they did, and they invited me to come. And I said, well, I'll just go for three years, and then I'll, I'll come back home to Michigan. Um, but then I got into the PhD program, and here I am. I'm still here. I haven't left, and I hope, I hope not to leave anytime soon. So that's one version of the story. I, I sugarcoated it a little bit, I'll, I'll be honest. There were other places that I might have been willing to leave that good life for. I was interested in studying religion, and uh, many of you, I think, are also interested in studying religion, and so you might know some of those other places that I would have left my good life for, places in Chicago or uh, North Carolina. Uh, and there's, there's one place in, I can't remember the name of, in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, <laughs> it must not be important. But anyway, <laughs> HDS felt different. It was different. It was unlike any place I'd been to before or since. And I want to spend a few minutes tonight just considering the difference. What is the difference? Or what do I see as the difference, the HDS difference? What is different about this place? <clears throat> I think it's not just the excellence of our faculty. We have excellent faculty. And I'm, I'm not being boastful here. I'm excluding myself from <laughs> that group. I've, I've been here on the faculty a short enough period that I still think of, of those people who are my colleagues and peers. I think of them still as mentors and teachers. And I look at these mentors and teachers, um, and I'm astounded by the work that they do and uh, the insight they offer our world. And so we have this amazing faculty, but other places in Connecticut and Chicago and so forth have good faculties too. We have amazing resources here. You all know this. But other places have amazing resources. Our library is the biggest, but still, other, <laughs> others have good resources. I think that we combine theory and practice here in a way that is unique. I think we really do do it better than, than most and maybe every other place that does try to combine those two things. But other places do it well and think hard and long about how to do it well. So I'm not sure that's exactly what distinguishes our difference, what makes our difference different. I think the best answer is our diversity. Our religious diversity, our diversity of every kind that we, that we have here. And you would say, and you'd be right to say, well, there are other diverse institutions too. But there's, there's something about diversity. The sheer fact of diversity doesn't necessarily distinguish a place. So what's different about our diversity? So let me tell you even more about my own story. As I noted earlier, I grew up in Michigan, uh, and I grew up in sort of a first ring suburb of an industrial city in Michigan. It was a, a fairly diverse uh, town. I'm Japanese, my mom is from Japan, and I grew up uh, feeling Japanese, and it was easy to feel Japanese in this even very diverse town because I grew up in Michigan uh, during an economic recession when uh, Toyota and Honda were overtaking General Motors and Ford as the largest car companies in the world. And it was something to be Japanese in Michigan at this time. It was a diverse place. People valued diversity. I didn't feel right. But I also knew that I was different. I knew I didn't quite fit in, especially into the story of Michigan, especially into the story of the auto industry and all the people around me. I knew I didn't fit in. The other thing about my growing up in in this part of Michigan is that it, I grew up in this, this sort of enclave of Dutch Christian Reformed religion. And the Reformation tradition, Christian tradition is one I respect deeply. One of my most cherished theological teachers is Karl Barth, the great Reformed scholar. Um, 
But to them, I'm Episcopalian, as was noted. To them, I was basically Catholic. Uh, in fact, they called me Catholic, and when they called me Catholic, they didn't mean it as a compliment. <laughs> I Religiously and, and sort of ethnically, in this place, I didn't fit in. I was different. I went from there to, to Notre Dame. I, I guess I believed them when they told me I was Catholic. <laughs> and, and there I found the opposite, right? I got there, I thought I was Catholic, and they told me that I wasn't Catholic. <laughs> Again, I didn't fit in religiously. Um, but then, I mean, Notre Dame, I, I have great love for my alma mater, and, but it's changed a lot in the past, what, 20 years since I, went to, when I, since I went to college. And it's a much more diverse place now than it was then. When I went there, it was, it was so non-diverse that my, my Asian ancestry wasn't even recognizable to most people there. I was just, just white like everybody else, right? I was not recognized as Japanese. I didn't fit into sort of their narrative of what it meant to be a person at that school. And then after that, I went to Japan. I went to live in Japan, right? I wanted to prove to all these people who told me that I wasn't Japanese that I was Japanese, right? And that was the wrong move because I've never felt less Japanese than I did <laughs> when I went to Japan. Because I didn't fit in there, right? In, in so many different ways, I didn't fit in there. And also the question of my religious kind of diversity was different there because it, I found there not only was I Christian in a non-Christian nation, I found that my own category of what religion was didn't fit into how Japanese people thought about the various practices that I, as a person raised in the West, might consider religious. I didn't fit. In all these places, I felt different because I didn't fit, didn't quite fit. Now, there, there are no sob stories here. I, I, was, I was happy, more or less, in every one of these places. I'm not trying to, to, to say that I wasn't. But in every one of these cases, difference was a negative category. It was about what fits and what doesn't fit. Difference was something to be overcome or negotiated or maybe overlooked or ignored for the sake of what was most fitting, for the sake of fitting in. So then I, I, you know, I did some other things after living in Japan and I applied to Harvard and, and I came here and I remember my first class here at Harvard, which was Introduction to Ministry Studies, a class that I'm actually teaching uh, this term. I had the privilege of teaching this term. And I remember sitting in the Sperry Room, which looked different than it does now. It's been renovated since then. Um, I remember sitting in the Sperry Room, which you've seen a lot of today. Um, and there were Tibetan Buddhists and Sikh filmmakers and Ghanaian Pentecostals. There were accomplished Baptist preachers and atheist painters and Afghan circus performers and women forging new forms of leadership in uh, American Islam. And then there was me. And I was perplexed because I didn't know where I fit. I didn't even know what the fit was, right? What did it mean to fit here? What was there to define myself either for or against? What was different about the difference in that space? And then I went to my first section meeting uh, which was, uh, I had, as section leader, the professor of, of a different course was my section leader, Professor Kevin Madigan, who's the Wynn Professor of Ecclesiastical History here. He's on leave now, so you haven't met him, but he's a delightful person and a wonderful teacher and scholar. And he, he really gave me the first words I heard as a student at Harvard, and he said, the first words out of his mouth were, we are here for you. We faculty are here for you. He said, this is a singular place, a place like nowhere else on earth, but what makes it singular is each of you. Each of you has your own particular work to do. Each of you is different. And our job as faculty is to help you do it. He said all of us here, faculty included, have our own singular task, this vision of this thing we're working on, this question we're working on, right? It's unique to us. But the mystery is we need to talk to each other and be with each other and engage each other. We need to be in the same room and have that conversation together in order to pursue all those different questions. So in this case, difference is not a thing to be overcome, not a thing to negotiate or overlook or to fudge. The difference is not about fitting in because there was nothing really to fit into. Rather, something was presented to us, to us that we might share. We might share a conversation or share a common practice of serious attention and critical thought and concern for justice. 
there was something different about the sense of difference. Still, what does this mean, right? So I was thinking more about, about my experience here at HDS as, as a student, especially as a master's student. And, um, you know, HDS is, is not a seminary, um, but we have a history that aligns with the history of seminaries, right? We were founded, as you can see on the plaque over the Johnston Gate, right? We, this Harvard as an institution at large was founded to train ministers. And we've trained ministers here at Harvard Divinity School throughout our history, and we continue to train ministers today. And so some of the history of what a seminary is, I think, might illuminate this question more of what sets us apart. Because ironically, I think what sets us apart is that we don't set ourselves apart. Let me say more about that. So the, the modern seminary actually developed in the Counter-Reformation in Europe. The Protestant Reformation happened in Europe, right? And there are all these competing Christianities in Europe. And the Roman Catholic Church said, okay, this is getting hairy. We need to train our priests in a safe place. We can't expose them to all the, the complexities and difficulties of these rising political and religious movements. We need to set our, our, our tender young priests, seminarians aside, and they establish seminaries. And actually the word seminary comes from the Latin word seminarium, which means seedbed. Right? And if you know what a seedbed is, it's where you grow a little, a little plant before it's strong enough to live in the world. So um, I, I, I live a, a little bit of a ways away from, from Cambridge uh, with my family, and one of the reasons we do is because we keep chickens and have gardens and so forth, right? Um, and so I know a little bit, my wife knows a lot more, but I know a little bit about gardening, and we, so we've started plants from seed every year. We try to grow food, right? Um, and that's what it is. You know, you're, you're using a spray bottle to give it just the right amount of water and trying to get the sun just right because it's, it's too cold outside here in Massachusetts in, in April. And you got it, right? But the ironic thing about these seed beds is that they're supposed to work better, but we have never had any success with our seeds coming in seed beds. In fact, the plants that we have had the most success with, our healthiest tomato plants, are what are called volunteers. Amen, Amen right? <laughs> right, Dan? So a volunteer is when a tomato falls off the vine and rots in the ground and you forget about it, right? And they come up on their own in the natural earth and they're hardened by the cold weather and they get the sun and the rain and they grow up strong and they produce the most amazing, the most amazing fruit. You know, the seminary concept is, is about setting aside, setting apart to protect from the world. And I think about my field ed uh, placements here at Harvard, and I, I worked at a church here in Cambridge where some of my main responsibilities were administering a feeding program or helping to administer a feeding program and, and working with an agency that did a uh, free needle exchange for people with AIDS in Cambridge. And I went to Lesotho in Southern Africa and worked um, at a place uh, which, which supported orphans, HIV and AIDS impacted orphans in Southern Africa. And I thought about how hard those things were and how they maybe hardened me, but only in the most positive ways that that might word connote. So difference in this case is not about setting things apart, making things or people or seminarians or students different from the rest of the world. I think when we think about difference, that kind of difference here, we want to put people right in the world, right where ministry or study or religion or politics or ethics or literature or all those other things we study here are. So here are a couple of insights into what difference means here, how HDS is different. Is different. I teach a preaching class or two here, and so I know that the quickest way to ruin a sermon is to turn it into a lecture, um, just like the quickest way to ruin a lecture is to turn it into a sermon. Um, and I'm not going to try to lecture to you now, not after the long day that you have already had, but I really can't go on without actually putting just a little, you can't, I can't resist, putting a, just a, before the food, putting a little bit of theological and philosophical flesh on the bones of this personal narrative that I've just shared. There are many, many modern thinkers, and some of the ones I respect most, um, who have written a lot that is dense and difficult, but also insightful and groundbreaking about the importance of difference. Um, there's a guy named Jacques Derrida who wrote about the, the difference, how difference irreducibly structures thought. There's a Japanese philosopher named uh, Hajime Tanabe who writes, writes about how difference structures, irreducibly structures morals. Uh, Gilles Deleuze, who's another Frenchman who, who writes about how difference irreducibly structures 
being in reality, but I'm a Christian priest. And so I want to tell you about Hans Urs von Balthasar, who was a Roman Catholic uh, priest and scholar. And he wrote about how difference irreducibly structures, not just morals or reality or thought, but how difference irreducibly structures love. How difference is the condition for love. He has this huge 16 volume uh, uh, trilogy of writings, and any one of those volumes would make a a handy and sturdy doorstop. They're huge. Uh, And I don't want to claim to have read all 16 volumes of this thing because I haven't uh, and would be found out quickly if I claimed I had. But for me and from what I've read, the most moving and interesting parts are when he's trying to give an account of God as love, this sort of standard Christian proclamation which comes out of the New Testament. And he's trying to think about about why Jesus? Why is there an incarnation? Balthazar is saying. Why do Christians think about God as Trinity? Where, where does this come from, Balthazar asks. And the reason is, according to Balthazar, because, because the, the idea of God, and this is sort of the classical Western conception of God, but the idea of God as this immovable, fixed, impassable singularity just doesn't persuade von Balthazar at all. And it doesn't persuade him precisely because, he asserts, God is love. Because love can't just be, love has got to love someone or love something. Love takes an object. It always takes an object. Unfocused kind of warm feelings of generosity are just unfocused warm feelings of generosity. That's not love, right? You can't just say, I love full stop. You love someone, or you love something. But it's even more than that, right? So before I had children, I have three kids, and before I had children, I would have said, and I wouldn't have been lying, I said, oh, I love children, right? (laughs) And that was true, and it still is true in sort of a common sense or an abstract way. But when you compare that sort of generalized feeling of warmth around cute little people, if you compare that feeling with what the daily acts of love that I do to care for my children, like changing diapers and, and getting mad at them or, or hugging them, those actual things, taking actual concrete people, objects, and what that love means is something different entirely. But this is the thing about that, right? And this is where Balthazar gets interesting. Because these creatures who I love so much This is more true or more dramatic for my wife than for me, but they came out of our bodies. They were part of me. And now they're not part of me. But it's only because they're not part of me that I get to love them. It's only because they're different from me, right? That they came out of me somehow. That they could become objects, other people, different people, people other than myself that I get to love. And that's something that happens throughout their lives as children, as they grow up. And I drop off my daughter at kindergarten for the first time this year, and I see her walk away from me. She's growing up, and she's getting older and going further from me. But that distance is actually what allows me to love her into the new person that she is becoming every day. And this is true, Balthazar says, not just from the parent to the child, but also the child to the parent. He says that that the child first realizes it is an autonomous self when it looks up at his mother and sees the smile on her face. And in seeing that smile on her face, Balthazar says, it realizes two things, that it is loved and that someone else exists to love him or her. Love needs an object. It needs a relation. It needs difference. And if God would be a loving God, Balthazar said, God could not just be some formal changelessness or formless changelessness. God had to love something and love somebody. So a distance opens in God, Balthazar says. And this is where he starts talking about the incarnation and the Trinity and so forth. And I don't need to go deep more deeply into any of that. And I don't want to get too mushy here tonight. But this is something, I think, of what I mean when I say that the HDS difference is difference itself. At HDS, there's a difference to the way we embrace difference here. Diversity here isn't just a nice asset or an appropriate goal, although it is those things, but it's not, it's not just that. Diversity is not just something that makes our brochure photos more appealing or our admissions numbers more impressive. It does that too, but it doesn't just, it doesn't just do that. Difference here isn't about what fits or what doesn't fit. 
It's not about setting ourselves apart from the rest of the world, about making ourselves different. Difference here isn't a fact among other facts about us. Difference is us. Difference is who we are. It girds us in all our pursuits. It structures the way we ask and answer our questions. It forms us as individuals and as a community of scholars and learners and practitioners. Don't get me wrong, I don't want to color these self-reflective spectacles with too much rose this evening. No place is perfect, not 45 Francis Avenue, and not anywhere else. HDS is not a perfect community of all loving scholars, not every day, anyway. We're a human institution, after all, and human institutions, um, like any other human institution, our difference is something that we negotiate and figure out and learn from and about every day. But the fact that we take this as one of our primary goals, maybe our most essential task, that learning about and from difference is what inspires us every day and all around, that fact makes a meaningful difference, not only in the lives of our students, but I also believe in the life of the world. Our different kind of difference makes a difference, as these Sikh filmmakers and Afghan circus performers and Baptist preachers and painters and ministers and scholars all go from this place into their future and into the world's future. And this is why, 11 years on, I hope never to leave 45 Francis Avenue. And it's why, though I realize all of you must leave for a time, I hope that I will see many, if not all of you, back here again one day. Thank you.